But we used to leave with our two, I think it was two or three pounds. Me and my brother came back clutching it like we can't let go of this. I was doing a paper round up until I think I was 18 actually. And people used to mock it. Until you had a skill, I didn't see any other way of earning big money. Go and work in a cancer ward. Go and work in a child's hospice. Go and work in a prison. Go and do something. Give something back to society. Put yourself in that situation and it will recalibrate your brain where you sit down at night and you think, okay, I understand life. <laughs> What's going on guys and welcome back to the Blue Tick Show. Opposite me today we've got a little bit of a special guest. Normally we've got the crime scene, we've got an entrepreneur today. It goes by the name James Exton. How are you and welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm good, thanks. We finally got you locked in. Yeah, after I know. It's a like few herding tries. cats trying to get me on a show. It's, it's not easy, it's not no. easy. It took us about four tries till we got it. <laughs> <laughs> We're here. But listen, I watched a few of your podcasts last night myself yep. and a lot of them are about mindset and about how to grow your business, entrepreneur yep. based. I want to do something a little bit different today. I yep. want to hear about you. I want to dive deep into your life and work yep. out who you really are and what's yep. turned you into the man you are today. 100% more than happy to get, get cracking with that. So let's take it back. How old are you now? I'm 34. 34, yeah. So let's say when James was 10 years old, that's when your life really starts. Yep. You know what I mean? What was it like? Upbringing, childhood, family? What was it all like? Yeah, so I can't sit here and moan at all. I had a love, loving home, yeah. roof over my head, all the things that people don't really appreciate. That's actually a, you know, a very good start in life that we can't all be um, you know, guaranteed. Yeah. Um, so yeah, good childhood, got a twin brother. Um, <laughs> I think just rascals, that. just troublesome. Just little, uh, I won't use the word, but my poor mum and dad. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> it's like there wasn't a second's rest. It was just just two feral little kids. But yeah, good Good, nice upbringing. Happy. And there's always one naughty brother, one naughty twin, and a good twin. Which one was you? Do you know what? For my mum and dad's sake, there wasn't a good one. Oh, really? It's just non-stop, oh, like relentless. <laughs> I feel Not a decent him. night's sleep him. from then till probably still now, to be honest. Yeah. So look, life's obviously changed dramatically, yeah. regardless if you had a good childhood or not. Yep. Yeah. You're now a man, yeah. And you're you're the, you're the man making money for the family, and you're yeah. like in control. Yep. Yeah. What changed? What went from being a 10-year-old little shit yeah, yeah. <laughs> to being the successful entrepreneur you are now? Very interesting, and it's been a, it's been a long and diverse journey. Yeah. Um, I'll take you back from the age of 12, so only a couple of years after yeah. we're talking about. I was still a kid, but ingrained within me and my brother's head was, you have to go and work if you want money. There's no tree here. There's no money coming out the floor. You know, this isn't magic money, monopoly money to get given for doing nothing. So... That was installed from my mum predominantly from a young age. Was mum and dad successful? Were they in what business? No, so my, my mum, like she's still like a market trader now. Yeah. So she's just like average, like nothing successful. My dad was the first person to go to uni in his house and he had a good like good job, but nothing nothing. Not, I'm nothing. gonna sit here and say like yeah. monumentally successful, no disrespect, but just like norm, yeah, norm, normal normal parents. Normal parents, yeah. And both from nothing. My mum her family lost everything overnight. She moved to London from like up oh, north wow. when she was 16. So she had a very kind of like measured approach to life that was nothing's guaranteed. Yeah. And you have to, you have to grow up graft or it's not going to happen. So that was like, I would say the most valuable life lesson. And the value of that is the same today sat here at 34 as it is when I was 10 years old. That's ingrained. That's like a, it's like a principle, a gospel in my head. So me and my brother were like, oh, we better get grafting. And this is at 12. <laughs> like now people are probably watching this thinking that's illegal. You can't yeah, be literally. doing that. So we were like, and obviously like barriers change what you want in life. But as a kid, obviously I was thinking, oh, I want a pair of trainers or, yeah. you know, like they think that like, barriers change in life. So that was like, how am I going to do that? And obviously things have changed price wise, but it was a lot of money back then when of you're course. 12. Of course. Listen, even if you want a 20 pound yeah. pair of trainers, that's a lot of money. 12 yeah. years old, that's big money. Yeah. So like, and even if it's like, I don't know, I remember it was like a pair of gloves to play in goal and football, something like Sondaco ones or something. Yeah, yeah. They're probably four quid at Sports Direct, but that was gold to me. Yeah, so me and my twin brother, we started to work in a paper shop at 12. The paper shop owner's probably dead now, so I can, I can say he's extorting <laughs> us clearly, like absolutely rinsing the pair of yeah. us. And now looking back at it, the other guy that did it was about 90, this old boy. And oh, he clearly shit. had dementia or something. Was getting ext we were all getting done clearly. Yeah. But we used to leave with, our two, I think it was two or three pounds. In well, that's the big money. No one understands. Mate, I was that. like, this is gold. Me and Literally. my brother came back clutching it like we can't let go of this. And we used to add that up and add that up. And my mum had no problem sending us out. It was like five in the morning to the paper shop to do that. So we, we started to get an understanding of like what two pounds actually meant and how many of those two pounds it would take to get the prized possession we wanted. So that value of money from that age was like, I get how hard it is to earn money. I get how long it takes. And I get then the thing I buy, I have to value. What's going on, guys? If you're watching this on YouTube, make sure you scroll down. We're now live on Spotify. So you can watch us while you're driving, listen to us, listen to us while you're in the gym. Pretty much just listen to us anywhere. And make sure you give us a five-star review on Spotify. Thank you. Yeah, no, 100%. And one thing I can relate to that is from a young age, my dad's always been successful for, in my life. I'm not yeah. going to sit here and say he hasn't been. And I always used to be like, 
he never gave me much as a kid. And I was like, why can't you like, you got money, I want yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. And he was like, listen, son, once I know you understand the value of money, yeah. I'll help you. Yeah. But until I literally like, because when you do come from a successful background, you are spoiled, you are. Yeah. You get what you want and you just, there's a lot of people who can become arrogant with it. And he always made me understand the value of money. And yeah. that's, you learned that yourself. No yeah. one kind of yeah. put that in your head. Your mum did to some yeah. extent, but you going out there, working yeah. for it, getting your little two pound, holding on to it. Yeah. Like, this is gold. This is it can mine. poison you, like you say. And, 100%. And that's another thing that you just touched on as well. And I think that's important. The thing, especially with social media, I can't stand is people don't have an ability to accept a person for who they are. So you could take a person from one background and a person from another background, one from extreme wealth, let's say, and success. But the parents could still give that person the same work ethic as the person who's had the graft for it. Yeah, 100%. Granted, you have a nicer roof over your head. I respect that. And you've had nicer things around you. But I know plenty of lads whose parents, like you say, were successful, but they gave their kids nothing. Okay, yes, they lived in a nicer house, yeah. whatever that means. Yeah, but they still both had love. They both still had the things they needed. And I also know people that had the successful parents who spoiled them rotten. And, and the arrogant. kids are lazy, and I'm not going to use a word. And they got no value of like graft, or they don't understand what it is to do the hard day's work. So it, you can still get that, install that in a kid, no matter who your parents yeah, are. 100%. Um, but some people see it, you know, like a, a life or death situation at the beginning. Um, but to me, as far as I knew as a kid, I wasn't able to make that judgment at that age anyway. I was like, yeah, I've got a roof on my head. But it's only when you grow up you appreciate what you had as well. Yeah. But I still you don't knew. know a big house or a small house when yeah, you're 12 years old. You just, you don't you've got a home, You're just a little kid running around, like <laughs> breaking things. Like, so that that two quid to me then was really important. And it like, was. and I and from a young age I always wanted, you know, like the nice trainers or the cool trainers or the cool hoodie or, you know, people at school had X and me and my brother were like knew my mum wasn't going to buy it for us. So it's like either earn it or or nick it or you don't get it or you're not getting it simple as big borrower still kind of thing so we were like we better go to work <laughs> uh, so yeah that, that's where we started in the, in the paper shop and yeah so just from, to smash it from 12 years old, 12 years old you were yeah. already a little grafter yeah just like grafting had around yeah yeah and then I did a couple of other little like rogue jobs like cleaning jobs as I got a little bit older 14, 15 where I was like a bit of a barrier like changing bins at yeah. events and my mum was running or just little kind of like cash in hand jobs when you were like 14, 15 getting like now four quid or six quid like a little bit extra and stashing it um, and then I moved on to a paper round yeah so I was doing a paper round as well, but that was um, just, I was doing a paper round up until I think I was 18 actually. And people used to mock it. And I was like, don't worry about it. It's cool. Cause I knew I could do that in my own time. It was the local paper. So yeah. it wasn't like- it, it didn't affect your life kind of thing. No, but it was all right money. And it added to everything else I was doing. And until you had a skill, I didn't see any other way of earning big money. And social media wasn't the same back then. If I'm 34 now, when I was 18, it was a dip. There wasn't the same- so, the Social media weren't here. No, there wasn't the same ability to make money at the click of a finger. So Never. the grafting and the hard hard jobs at a young age was probably slightly different to people growing up now in terms of there's more ability. There's never been more ways to make money than there is now. And I think just from your upbringing, a lot of people now probably look at you and think like, you do work hard. I've watched, I've seen yeah. it. I've gone through your Insta. I've had to do my research. Yeah. And you're a hard worker. That's one thing that, and even the people we have me and mutual friends are, all hard workers. Yeah, 100%. So people don't understand your childhood is what's turned you into the man today. A lot of people look at you now and I have watched previous podcasts where you're giving life lessons and people, there are probably some haters who go like, how is this guy giving life coach mm, lessons? Like, mm. how is it even possible? But you've had a childhood some people haven't had. Yep. And whether it's privilege or not, you've grafted to get to where you've got to today. Yeah, 100%, yeah. And I think that makes a massive difference because a lot of people, some people get lucky. Yeah. Some people don't want to work yeah. and sit at home doing fuck all. Yeah. Some people go on social media, they look good and make hundreds of pounds a post and they're just they're just living yeah, yeah, that yeah. easy life. Yeah. But from just talking to you, we've been talking for 10 minutes, it sounds like you've got dreams and you don't, this ain't nowhere where you want to be. Yeah. Like, as in you've got big, big goals in yeah, life. 100%. And whether you've got a do a paper round, sell that thing, do this, do that. You don't give a shit. You're here no. to make money and that's and literally it. Yeah, and I always think another lesson sort of like ingrained from a childhood, nothing's promised. Yeah. So you could be big on social media. You could be like slapping, everyone likes you, you're the, the trend of the month, making big money, brands are coming in, your life's on a pedestal, everything's good. But to me, does that have longevity? I'm not saying it doesn't, but my brain doesn't work like that. I don't think that's promised. Do you know what I mean? You only look a certain way for a certain period of time. Trends change, people's perception of things change. So for me, I always want to have the business element behind it as well. And I feel like social media for me, I look at it as it's a bubble that could pop. Not necessarily the whole bubble, but your bubble could pop. Yeah, it could. Algorithm you've seen could people. change. You've it seen could destroy people. you for no reason. Like you've not done anything wrong, doesn't mean you're bad at what you do or you're not popular, but algorithm could just destroy your earning potential overnight and you're sat there going, ah. And your whole business is gone. Yeah. So for me, it's always been important to create that business 
foundation that doesn't mean that you are the brand and only you can make the money what's going on guys this video is being brought to you by morris andrew solicitors as you're all aware we've done a season two all about crime if you watch that all and you're in any situation like that and need help getting out of the situation reach out to morris andrew solicitors and see if it's something they can help you with remember there's a defense for every offense so when did the business come into yeah, so continuing life. on that kind of journey, I guess, if, if we go back, so so paper round and then school, obviously, I did school. How was you in school? Good? Naughty? In, out, shake it out, all about. Like, <laughs> so, so, like, for, to give you an example of us <laughs> saying me and my brother, she, she didn't get arrested. I flooded my primary school, kicked you out. flooded your primary yeah, school? Yeah, at the same time, my brother was thrown out for, like, Wait, just, wait, wait, you can't just say I flooded my primary school, I move on. you got to tell her. I, I don't know why, like, this is what I mean. I had a but good how? upbringing, and I was a nice kid. I was, so I just put all the plugs in all the sinks when everyone's <laughs> playing football and just flooded the whole of the school. <laughs> So obviously now they've got the tats, we go, whoosh, whoosh, yeah. cost of living and that, but um, back then. But again, that's the kind of thing that my mum was, my mum and dad tried to do the best with us, but I just thought that was a good idea. You can't change that. <laughs> I just that wasn't that was my dad saying flood the school? That like, sounds just, like a great yeah, idea, just, honestly. That's the kind of call they get, your son flood the school. You, you've done what? Yeah. And then luckily, like, <laughs> like my dad's no longer with us, but luckily at the time I had two parents because my mum will be on the phone like, oh, he's punched someone. I have to go and get him and take him home. And then my dad's on the phone like, oh, he's done what? Okay, I'll come and get him. <laughs> And then both you have to be separated. It's just a it's just a nightmare. But so at school, naughty, always naughty, conti continuously the whole way through, even university, like that like naughty. What was you studying just, in uni? I did law at uni. I wanted oh, to really? do law. So okay. at school, I wasn't. I wouldn't say I was an academic. Yeah. I wasn't naturally the kid that sat there, read something, understood it, and and got an A. Um, but in my head, again, that work ethic, I was like. I think I need good grades to do well in life and I want to do well. I don't want to be a, a, a kind of a, a, like a, a failure in my head. I always thought there has to be something here that I can take from this. Yeah. And I was always very calculated with what I did. The paper chop was to make the money. The paper round was to make the money. That was the end goal. School, okay, it was a jolly and I'll mess around. But in my head, it was like to get the grades, to get the money. So I there's used it. a plan. There yeah, was there was always... a game plan. And I was like, I don't like this. I don't enjoy it. I'm not particularly good at it. It was like awful at maths and stuff. Like I just <laughs> didn't get it. But I was like, if I smash it hard enough and long enough, it's got to stick. Yeah, something's got to work. Like, and my brother was naturally a lot brighter than me. I happily say that, even though we're twins. I was sat in the, the, the set that people used to laugh and throw things at you, you know, like and say you're an idiot. And I was that guy in the math set, like the bottom set or whatever. But I put in enough man hours that I was able to get the, like decent enough grades. Yeah. And then went on to secondary school, same principle. And I, at that point, I started to see the way life could turn. People were going off on different tangents and being mischievous at primary school is one thing, but mischief turns into crime. Yeah, it does. That's school. true. Yeah, the of course. Transition. So what sort of innocent fun, if you're that kid that's going to go down that path. Becomes path. illegal. <laughs> yeah. And then when you're so orientated by money and money's the main driving aim, and you've now got that temptation where mischief turns to crime, which can elicit money. You're in a very... There's no more boundaries no more. No, there's a very dangerous route you can take at that point. And I went down a certain route and, and wasn't the best behaved adolescent, let's just say. I got myself in trouble numerous times. With police? Or... Yeah, yeah. Yeah? And I was given my... I had the chance, luckily, and I was... And we'll come on to what I went on and did it as a career, but I had a second chance. And I was lucky. And the people that I was friends with, my friendship groups, and still am today, they went that step further. Okay. And they, you know, they're still in that of custody and stuff now. And so, but again, I always had at the back of my mind, that's not the life I want. I've got the things I want. I've got yeah. to re-navigate the way in which I get to these things because one of them is going to take me down a path of losing my freedom. Yeah. Um, and ultimately, temporary success potentially or long-term success if I don't get, don't caught. get caught. Yeah. Which plenty of people don't and, and no criticism. But <laughs> in my head, I was like, I've done the work at school, like I'm willing to put in a graft and I think I can make something, another route. And I went on to law and at 16, 17 year old version of me, I was fascinated by crime. Yeah, fascinated everyone, everyone is. When you're, when you're listening to stuff like that, yeah, and I was you, a, everyone thinks you can be the best lawyer in the world, yeah, but it's not easy. Yeah, get yourself out of stuff. And and, and I, I did get out of, of, of a bit of trouble that I was in through my own Oh really, you did, yeah? Yeah, and so maybe I had good intentions but wrong intentions at the time but I wanted to be successful and that's what interested me in doing the degree so in my head again law I was like <laughs> I'm interested in it criminal law found fascinating and there's money in it so that's what I want to do let's do that not as a kid as a kid I didn't have a clue but I grew into that and I was like that's what I want to do and I can help people as well so that's a bonus right and I can help friends and whatever so immature me was like that's what I'm going to do I've got the grades so 
being crafty and stuff, university, again, it never really, I was never hyped by university. I lived a funny childhood and adolescent, like the thought of going out and your mum not knowing what time you got home and being allowed to drink, I could do that anyway. So yeah. it wasn't, I wasn't that kid that was turning up like, oh, I can go wild here. I was there to get a degree to go and make money and have a career out of it. So I applied for the best university that I could go to with my grades. And I could have gone to Oxford or Cambridge. Oh, really? Straight A's and A stars, yeah. Oh, so, so you did do well. You can't yeah, grafted, that, yeah, yeah, grafted, you can't say you weren't bright. You yeah, yeah, yeah. It. And I'm not saying, yeah. I put blood, like, blood, sweat and tears in, so I'm happy to say that as well. Again, the work ethic um, into that was like, I, I worked my ass off. Just speaking on that, I had a guy I'd done a podcast with yesterday. You probably know him, Johnny Fisher, the boxer. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he turned around to me and he goes, when I was in year... He, he done a CATS test. Yeah. You know what it is? Yeah, it's like a mental yeah. capacity test thing. And he goes, they put me on the red the red list. I was done that bad. And he was like, when I saw that red list, he goes, Mikey, he goes, I'm not smart. He goes, but I never wanted to be on that red yeah. list again. I graft yeah, yeah. school. All A stars. Yeah, yeah. So well, it is possible. It school, is possible. Because I was in the bottom set for maths and stuff. And I'm and like, but school was a system. So a lot of it was a memory test. I'll come to the that, conclusion. You could I just agree. memorize yeah. things. So if you could, if you would put the hours in to be a sponge, you didn't even, so for instance, right, in French, okay, if you ask my name in French, I can say, Je m'appelle James. That's about the limit you're going to get from <laughs> me. Yeah? But I got an A at GCSE. Oh, you got an A at French? Yeah. But because the oral exam, was a memory exercise. So I just memorized what I needed to say. I don't know what I was saying in that assessment. <laughs> so you can't speak. <laughs> so you couldn't speak any French? No. But and you... my friend wrote the presentation <laughs> for me. But I spent hours, like, you know, like you used to have to write lines, memorizing like a script, like, yeah, a, like yeah, an yeah. actor. So I memorized the script and just went. <laughs> Shit, seriously, that's how you done sponge. it. Yeah, so, but I I'm, I'm don't understand French. A French person could have asked me like questions, Anything. but they had the pre-prepared questions. So I knew if they ask, ask question A, I need to go B, because I'd remember. So it's a game, right? So through school, I did all that. So what I'm saying is I wasn't naturally academic, but I just persevered and thought I, I kind of need this. And I think that approach has changed now. Like GCSEs yeah. and A-levels are a lot more redundant than they were back then. I no think one cares about them nowadays. No one I don't really, really hear anyone mention it. No, so... And you can go on and do whatever you want. And did I need those grades? Yes, to get my degree and yes, to go to law school and do what I did. Did I need them to create my business? No. But what I went on to do was I studied law. I'll go through that little journey with you as well, just to continue the, yeah. the timeline. Otherwise, we'll get, we'll get lost. But So I knew Oxford and Cambridge wasn't for me. What, what yeah. made you think that though? Stereotype. Did you go and do like the open days and Stereotype. stuff like that? No, I didn't even turn up because I just knew that I was going to spend three years around people that probably weren't going to accept. My behaviour back then was appalling. <laughs> so like they would have thought I was lost when I turned up and I just didn't think it would have gone the well. way I wanted to. And as much as I wasn't there for a jolly, three years with people that weren't really kind of my people I was a bit, bit of a headache. depressing thought. So, so then I was like, right, Nottingham. Nottingham was the top university for law. I'm putting that down. I don't need to go and view it. Everyone's like, I'm going to go do viewing days. I'm going to go look around in my halls. I don't care. I need to go. In yeah. my head, I need to go to get to where I need to go. So I just put that down, filled it in, didn't even know where I was. Thing Turned up day one with my bags packed, never been there in my life. Everyone's talking like, oh, did you select this hall? I said, what's a hall? I don't have a clue. I'm here. I'm just here to get my bags degree. packed. I've got probably not enough pants and socks. I'm not really in the room. <laughs> First day, I'm, I, I was an eight, 18, 19 year old going on 14. I'm throwing bread rolls on day one, <laughs> like in the canteen, thinking I'm still at school. In the lecture hall for the first, we've got 400 people doing law. I'm throwing a rubber. And the thing is, when it's, when it's law, <laughs> when you're Everyone's studying... Like, uh, excuse me, do you mind not doing that? And I'm thinking, <laughs> I need to settle down. Thinking, and like, he's like, oh, man, yeah, boring, man. What's yeah, going on? I was expecting then, some fun. And I remember in the first two weeks of uni, again, I'd just kind of been dumped in this place where I knew I had to be here and I had to make it work, but I didn't know how to behave really again. So, so wait, when did you kind of just chill out a little bit? Because well, <laughs> within the first few weeks, I got back after a night out, everyone had a few drinks and these people were kind of being not rude, but trying to take the mick out of me and what have you. And me being just thinking I was a little like bad man at the time and just not yeah. very mature. I just flipped and smashed this room up at uni. <laughs> but then realized these are all civilized adults and I need to be an adult. And I had to go back to London and take like a time out because people were like, this kid's a nightmare. <laughs> this guy's and I was like, I'm going to get thrown out of uni. Like I need to settle. So, so I did, did, did uni and I made over time, I made a good group of like a small group of friends that were on the same level. Obviously, I matured massively and I'd removed myself from the environment I'd been back in London where I was around things that were more tempting to be troublesome. Yeah. And I started, my life started to change just by my environment, if you like. Um, but I still I stuck to myself pretty much most of the time and I was there to do my work and, and get it done. So that was uni <laughs> and I spent three years at Nottingham and then I went to, um, after that, to be a barrister, which is what I qualified as a barrister. You have to go to bar school. So you're done proper, you didn't? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't, I didn't mess about. And I applied for a scholarship to be a barrister. I thought they're going to take one look at me. I think no chance. I think no chance. And, and this is important for people watching this, actually, because 
maybe we live in a day and age where people do judge you. Or maybe we think people judge you when they don't. So I applied for a scholarship because I thought everyone else is. I'll give it a whirl. I'll chuck, chuck, chuck an application and see what's what. And it was to pay for my barrister school, which was at the time 12 grand. That was the, the fee, which I'd saved up because I'd worked the whole way through uni part-time What was you working as? Lifeguard at Swimpool, a, a okay. virgin active. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so just doing shifts, uh, early shifts and night shifts around lectures. And club promotion. Just anything, like anything usual, just grafting. Money. I was... um. Yeah, I was just club promoting, running around. I made my own little business cards, just putting them over under everyone's doors and halls. And then I'd just deliver your ticket on a bike. But no Sweet. one else would. So I cleared up because there was 16 halls in like a big park on campus. So you've done everyone, basically. So I was just like delivery boy, yeah. And I negotiated a new, negged a new <laughs> rate with the, with the club. I was like, look, I'm delivering. I've got wear and tear on my bike. It's a quid a ticket, not 50p or whatever. Um, so I was always, always grafting away, just I in the background. Um, so I applied for the scholarship. And at the time, I was like, I'm not going to get it. I'm surrounded by all these guys that I think are just right for the right for the scholarship and I'm just not that person. Even like the haircut, whatever, I was the only person with a shaved head. And it was like, I felt like an alien, if I'm honest. And I know nowadays we're probably a lot more accepting, but back then it was people were in boxes. So um, went to the scholarship interview, everyone's in a three piece suit. I'm in a Tesco suit, 40 quid. Again, my mum being my mum, like, that's fine, it's a suit, it's like a your suit, clothes, it's 40 quid. Like, that's what I can afford, fine, like, right, fine. Yeah, suit's a suit. Looked all right. I thought it looked good. Yeah. I, felt, I, felt, I felt good about myself. <laughs> People have got um, wheeled in briefcases. They've got pocket, I didn't even know what it was at the time, pocket squares. I'm thinking, I only need that if I've got a cold. Yeah. Like, why do I need a handkerchief? <laughs> oh, so shit, I'm sat in this me. waiting room. So I'm thinking, again, I've, I've done well with, in my I head. I've, 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 I've come this far. Yeah, I've come this far to kind of, I've, I've created my own journey, but I'm now kind of a bit lost. Am I in the wrong place? Where? So they call me into this boardroom. And what bag did you have at this point? No bags, <laughs> rocked up in a suit. <laughs> Just rolled up. Your People have got, you know, um, like fountain pens yeah. with like quills and ink and stuff. Like these guys think they're already barristers and they're not. I, I've got a big biro, I'm content. Like, what do I need a pen for? <laughs> anyway, so I'm sat there and I walk in and there's 12 people in a room in a board boardroom for the scholarship application. One's like a senior politician I actually recognised off the news but couldn't tell you what her name was but I knew she was big time. And I'm like, ah, oh, I'm in deep here. This is, this is intense <laughs> this is and I'm in my 40 quid suit. I've got a skin fade. I'm not looking in the bill here. Am I going to get anything? I thought, no, I'm going to commit to this. Like, I've, uh, uh, from, I'm in now. I might from the well. paper shop to here, like this is a journey I've got to nail it I'll give everything 110% and actually these people outside that I've tried to have a conversation with on the level just like hi guys anyone, everyone alright anyone get a drink <laughs> everyone's like meh, 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 meh. and no one can have a conversation I think I've got something on these guys a bit of charisma yeah. a bit of energy a bit of passion a bit of drive and these people are sort of on the nerdy end of the spectrum no disrespect but the job I wanted to do I've got to sit in a cell with someone that's murdered someone and have a conversation yeah. or someone that's done whatever so there has to be an element that, it's got to that's be a bit, not relatable obviously not murderer but you've got to have some sort of yeah or, yeah. or be able to be malleable, like, you yeah, know, adapt, like, to, adapt the to the situation. To, exactly. And these guys couldn't. So I thought, you know what? That's, that's given me a strength. And I'd met another guy who had a criminal record as well. And we both had taints against our name, let's just say, that the, the bar council will look into, which again, you have to justify why you couldn't behave when you were younger. <laughs> but again, that was an easy conversation. Yeah. I was just an idiot. I, everyone deserves a chance. And that's why I want to be in this profession to help other people because so many people get convicted of minor crimes and could be assisted and mentored away from going that further down that route at early stage intervene and, and do something constructive with it. So anyway, I did it. I thought, you know what? That went all right. Did it I, actually Yeah, I thought right that went really well. I thought I, I, I spoke to everyone. I gave everyone eye contact, all 12 people. I shook everyone's hand and all these other guys. Just basic things where I just, I was so used to grafting and being around so many different diverse people. Nothing really fazed me. I was like, all right, mate. Like I'd fist pump that one and shake that one's hand if I needed to. <laughs> like, you know, you just how it comes yeah, yeah. to you naturally if it does, if you've been around that. So did that and, and I got the letter through the post I got 12 grand I got a scholarship you it got was it. published in the Sunday Times and I was like do you know what everyone else in that, that room and that for me I didn't need you know to be where I am now in life I didn't need the grades yeah I, I could have still done what I did but to have that vote of confidence where someone a group of 12 people in society that most of us would look at and go okay fair enough they're respectable people yeah. saw value in me from that point on I had a new level of confidence not arrogance, but I was like, actually, do you know what? I have got, I need to have self-belief. It, it shows you that your hard work does pay off. Yeah, and people can see the merit in what you do. And I was like, okay, fine, I've got something here. And that was the first time I had that real validation. Not that you need it, but I think as blokes as well, we don't yeah. say it enough. But a pat on the shoulder is nice sometimes. 100%, 100%. And as blokes, we don't like to do that to one another. Girls will be like, oh, you look amazing. <laughs> when did your guy last say to you, Oh mate, I love your hoodie. No, never. They can't. Never. They cuss me. They'll, they'll go and like, buy it, yeah, yeah, yeah. low key, and copy you. Or they'll violate me. Yeah. Or they'll be rude about it. But so that was a massive for me in terms of my my 
childhood and going into a man, that was a pinnacle moment for me where I knew from that point on, you could put me in most environments, whether it's a meeting, a boardroom, a business related thing. And I think I now have something behind me where I can be confident what I'm delivering. I can be confident what I'm saying because I feel like that's been proved. Yeah. And I've got that sort of line on in the sand where I can go, thank you. Like that's, that's, that's an achievement. you've got professionals who have said, yeah, you know what? Yeah, Stamp. exactly. We yeah. prove you kind of thing. Yeah. It's not just you being like cocky thinking, yeah, I've got this. Yeah, because I was always, and I think a lot of people, you feel like an imposter or you're not able to kind mm. of, you feel scared to, to to kind of go to that extra level because you're worried what people will think of you. And I hold so many people back in what they do. It does. And, and, and I was a bit reclusive up until that point, even at law school and stuff. I was like, oh, just be quiet, just get on my work. I don't want people thinking I'm sick of being a barrister. <laughs> even in court, when we had to do these mock trials. People were acting. That wasn't me. I, wasn't, like, I felt awkward trying to be sick at what I was doing. You know the kid in French where you say like bonjour and someone goes bonjour like, <laughs> it was a bit and you get punched up after French. It was a bit yeah, OTT. Yeah. So I was always that guy who was a bit more measured and, and but after that gave me the And kind what of were switch. the mock, mock trials like? Did Horrendous. you do well at them? Yeah, as soon as you say um yeah. or stutter out. Seriously? Yeah. Oh Brutal, shit. Brutal because they're all practicing judges or barristers. So you can't even like if you stutter once you start uh out. Yeah, they they installed in you because when you're questioning people, you have to be thinking almost two, three questions ahead of that person. So I'm asking you a question, but in my head, I have to have a flow chart because you could give me an answer I don't want to hear. If I, don't, if I get the answer I don't yeah. want to hear, I can't sit with in front of a jury of 12 people and suddenly go, Yeah, but that's probably helped you so much with even meetings where you've had business meetings, people have tried to, even negotiations and shit like that. Eventuality. You have to kind of flow. 10 steps ahead of, yeah, you have to even if they throw a question at you, you've already expected that answer, so straight back at you kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you have to have every eventuality mapped out, which is quite quite an interesting skill, but really, really good. And although I don't practice in that profession now, it's it's a life skill. Yeah, it has. And, And having that behind you as well, I used to go to things where, I used to be worried about the world. I used to have dreadlocks or like always had funky hairstyles and stuff. And I used to always- Dreadlocks? Yeah, I used to have dreads. <laughs> I shaved it off for, I, I raised, good thing about social media, I raised 20 grand for a friend that had terminal cancer. Nice. Just bicked my head in the street and had long dreads. I'll, I'll dig a photo afterwards. But after that, I was kind of, I thought I've got a really good skill set here and like I've achieved something which I think is quite a big achievement in life. So I can go into, obviously I migrated into fitness now and that's one of my main businesses. But obviously a lot of that's commercial and the stimulation behind that's commercial is the business side of it. So I feel quite confident in that setting, which if I hadn't done that course and that professional background, maybe I wouldn't have had the same level of confidence. Yeah, and it's helped you in ways that you probably don't even know it's helped you in. Like even this podcast here, some people I do podcasts with, it's they are. Uh, yeah. Uh, whereas I've asked you about four questions. Do you mm. know what I mean? It's you can talk, you can tell a story, you can adapt to the situation. And I'm sure if... You weren't sitting with me and you were sitting with a lot more of a mature podcaster, you'd be able to adapt to that situation as well. You're yeah. not going to sit here and talk about throwing a rubber at us. Do you yeah, know what I mean? Yeah, Does, yeah. You're very adaptable and that's what makes you so successful in loads of ways. Mm. And when was the first point where you opened up your successful businesses? Because I'm sure you have. Yeah, so, so 2012, 2013, I started the brand I'm wearing now, which is London Muscle, which is a, a global fitness brand. Yeah. But it was a hobby. So I was working in a law firm in Oxford Street and I was on my phone under the table and we'd be grafting away for about six months. We, it was just a hobby that I started with my twin brother and another set of boys. We were just into training. Um, that's massive now though. Yeah, yeah. It's it did, big. it blew up. Yeah, yeah. And we're now, uh, February just, now we're 10 years so that's wow. quite for us again this in a market which is is massive but saturated in many respects for me it's amazing achievement to have, to have done that and i'm re- really kind of proud of what we've achieved with that and the t- total turnover over that period of time and to keep that vessel going is, is cool um so that started 2013 officially started as a company 2012 the social start and the business incorporated yeah. in 2013 um so that was a hobby led business never really thought i'd do that in life that was just a bit of fun. On I the thought side. I was going to be working, yeah, working for a law firm all my life, um, and and navigating that journey of me being a man and turning into a man. The pinnacle moment of obviously qualifying and the bits we just talked about. And at that point, I was working for a law firm, and I won't go into too much detail because I'm not one that's here for sympathy. But long story <laughs> cut short, my dad was diagnosed with cancer and died within three months. Fit, oh, healthy wow. bloke. So Sorry that was the second pinnacle in my life. Um, and again, I'm not here to to bang on heartstrings. That's not my vibe. But in the worst thing to happen in my life, and I have to accept that, but the best thing to happen in my life, not if I could change it today, don't get it twisted. Everyone, Everyone watching this knows Everyone what I'm trying would. to say. I would flick a switch. I'll give everything to have it back. But I have to take a good from it. And the best thing I can take from that is it gave me that next level of kind of drive and just a mindset switch. It was a light bulb moment where I was like, from this point on, nothing matters. 
Why am I getting bogged down in stressful situations? Stock not arriving, parcels going missing, whether it's in the context of a business, a rubbish month in business. Yeah. If, I can, if I can eat and I've got my limbs intact, I'm healthy, bonus. What a day. And do you know what? That's the best life lesson other than all the stuff ingrained from a childhood I could have had. And the thing is, I know you probably don't want to touch on it too much, but... No, I don't, I don't, I'm happy to talk about it, but I just, for people viewing it, I never want people to... You don't want people sitting there and think, oh, stop. I'm not like, clouting yeah. off it at all. It's, it's a bad situation. So no one knows this, but, well, I don't know, people probably watching it do know. My mum was diagnosed with cancer two years ago, got a FaceTime call, and I'm always the last one to know everything in my yeah, family. Yeah. I'm a little bit of a hot head. I'm like the black sheep of the family. Yeah, yeah. Get a FaceTime call. All the siblings, it's five of us, all the siblings are in a call. And my mum turns around and goes, oh, yeah, I got cancer. Like laughing about it. I was like, listen, you lot, fuck off. Like, yeah. honestly, I'm not in the mood. I'm, I was pissed off. It was like yeah. one o'clock in the morning. Yeah. They've all hyped themselves up to tell me. They've all got in a group call yeah, because they don't was. know how I'm going to react. Yeah. I was like, I'm driving. I was driving to my girlfriend's house. This, but I was like, you lot, honestly, like, what's this bullshit? Like, yeah, you lot yeah. trying to wind me up now. Like, I was yeah. fuck off. Hung up on them all. And then I was like, oh, fuck. <laughs> I was like, I've just hung up on them. Yeah. What if they're telling the truth? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Phoned them back. And I was like, yo, you look like being serious here or are you just trying to like wind me up? This ain't a joke. Like, yeah, it's a yeah. bit sick in the head if yeah, you yeah, trying to joke. Yeah. Long story short, found out it was all real. Found out they all knew for months. No one told me because, yeah, yeah. but mum got really ill. About. So they had to kind of tell yeah. me, obviously. And I think that without me knowing has changed me as a person yeah, massively because I kind of live life now. Life is too short. My mum's still alive. Touch wood, like she survived it. Yeah. But I watched my mum go from being... My mum is still beautiful today, but I saw the whole transition of chemo, losing her hair, yeah, becoming a stool. And I was on the hospital trips. I was the one who would take her hospital one back. And from seeing my mum go there, strong woman, energetic, would clean the house every single day. We used to live in a house, like, not used to live in a house, but I used to live with my mum. House was cleaned every single day. Yeah. And looking at her on the way to like one of her last chemo trips, I looked at her and I just not didn't recognise her, but it was... That wasn't my mum. No, no, no. And yeah, the transition's horrible. That people who have lost family members and stuff, people don't really realise how much that changes as a person. Yeah, yeah. And I think all I can say to you, as much as it's the worst thing that's ever happened, the hunger behind that is given you. Yeah, 100%. Nothing, no childhood nothing memory nothing. can even no. touch it. And you've got two ways you can go with that. And I don't say there's a wrong or a right way. In my head, I always just, I've always got a driver. So in my head, I work a lot on my own. Like I'm self-employed for to a large extent of it. There will be days where I get up, work, train, go to bed, get up, work, yeah. train. You don't see another human. Life's on repeat. Yeah, exactly. So, but I've always got that voice in my head. Like I've never got a day and, and, and we'll probably touch on it, but I'm a buzzy guy. Like I'm yeah. motivated. I've got energy by the bag full. But there are days where you're kind of dwelling a bit or you're just feeling a bit sorry for yourself. But I've always got that. And I know it sounds ridiculous. I look up to the clouds and I think, get on with it. Yeah. You got to, because I know what's going to be set up there. Do you know what I mean? Like I don't want to be. So I've always got that like guiding kind of rule, and and, and to me that's I take a huge amount of comfort from that as well. And when the going gets tough, and I, I've said this probably if you've seen on other podcasts, I genuinely mean it. I feel like it's like you said, it's unlocked something in me where I'm able to not. I can switch off from pain now. Physical pain, I switch off because nothing's gonna. N no pain is gonna compare to what's happened. No, and it I can't. And, and when you see and. The worst thing is you and I don't know what pain means because when you see, and I'm not, you know, anyone that's lost anyone, there's no good or bad way for someone to go. So I'm not saying it's the worst, but you know, cancer, like someone's 80 kilos is now 40. They're a yeah, bag of bones like. screaming. In, like you see, it. being an adult when you see it as well is different to being a child. It's both horrendous. But when you're like early 20 year old man and you've got your mum to look after, you you don't get um sheltered from the situation no, 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 you, you are in deep you it's, see a person rotting it's you and your screaming mom, like, and it's your mum as well it's your dad it's it's your you can't even begin to understand the pain that person's going through i've never experienced pain like that and god help me if i do but to see a grown man scream and and be in that situation when you know someone's a tough sod i i feel disrespectful to even I moan about that's anything. what i was just about to say to sit there and complain about but the other day, I swear That's to what them, annoys me about social media. I had a, like, in the last, I'd say, year, my whole mindset of life has changed. If I can't control it, I don't, the other day I was driving home from central London. It, yep. We was all, all out for dinner and pulled out a petrol station and I was just tired, yeah. complaint, just didn't give a shit. I just yeah. wanted to get home. Yeah, yeah. And I'm driving, I've literally licked the side of an island. Oh, boom, boom. Wheel. Both wheels popped. Yeah. And I just looked up and I thought, you know what? Really, God? Really? Yeah, yeah. But it is what it is. It is what it is. And I pulled up on the side. I phoned an Uber. I left. The, I didn't even. I locked my car. I phoned an Uber. Went home and I said, I'll deal with this in the morning. Yeah, like, yeah. Two o'clock in the morning. Yeah. I don't care. No. And I think 
I haven't lost her. I've lost my auntie, but I haven't lost my mum or someone. But I kind of just live life now. You've had that awareness though. A lot more shit is going on in the world than yeah, to yeah, me yeah. worry 100%. about two pairs of tires. Like I think it is what it get, is. You know, like you said, like you can be hot headed and stuff. I think. <clears throat> I genuinely think for people that are in a position, I'm really grateful for people watching this that haven't been through that. And I really hope that you don't go through something horrendous. 100%. Like, I'm not saying it feel left out that you haven't been through <laughs> yeah, it. Like, it's, it's not, not what I'm saying at all. You don't want to go through I, that. No. But not. I do think, and, and a lot of the work I do now, I do a lot of work in kind of rehabilitation. I work in prisons and I work with people from, from backgrounds where they haven't had the roof over their head I've talked about. And that's stuff that a lot of us take for granted. And I think also working in that environment and for people that haven't been through any hardship or haven't seen life how it can be, if you do feel like you're someone that can't control even the smallest little things in your life, everything's a catastrophe, everything's serious, yeah, yeah. put yourself in another situation. Go and do something voluntary. Go and work in a cancer ward. Go and work in a child's hospice. Go and work in a prison. Go and do something. Give something back to society. Put yourself in that situation and it will recalibrate your brain where you sit down that night and you think, okay, I understand life. Because too many people live in a bubble and being ignorant, I don't think is a good thing for your life. Nah, and it, in a purely selfish way to you, it will change your life because you will live by different mantras, I think. And I think you'll live in a way that's more productive. And I think you'll have more of awareness. I just think it makes people a better person. So a lot of people do struggle with minor things, don't they? It's, do you know what I can't I've stand watching it. I can't listen to it. Do, do you know what I've realized as a person? I think I used to live life where if something goes wrong in my, world, in my life, I felt like the whole world, like Against you said, you. not even that, it just... Even if I'd split up with a girlfriend, I think, oh, my whole world's finished. Like, yeah. My whole world's over. Like, yeah, you can't contextualise yeah, it. Yeah, and I just... And then I started to, like, really deep life when that happened with my mum and stuff. And I thought, like, what? The? Yeah. All right, we split up. Press reset. See you later. All yeah. right. That, I, that parcel I wanted to... That outfit I wanted to wear today, I didn't I get... Know. Oh, well, next. What else am I wearing? Like, I still get annoyed about little things, but I'm do, able but to just go, boom, within yeah. about five minutes. I'm like, it's not a thing, right, but before, I'm annoyed. I swear to God, there was one day I can relate to. Come to the restaurant. I bought a new Gucci white shirt and I bought a pair of Louis Vuitton uh, white trainers. And I thought, I'm going to look sick. Yeah, yeah. Sent one of the boys to the dry cleaner. I said, get it steamed for me because it was a bit creased. Yeah. I was like, I need, I, this is the outfit. Yeah, this yeah, is yeah. drip tonight. Yeah. yeah. And I forgot to pick it up from the um, dry cleaners. I swear to God, something that small back in the day, it annoyed me for about a week. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. Was few, yeah. I was yeah. like, I've lost out on a whole outfit I was going to wear. And then now... I I, yeah. do, I leave stuff at the dry cleaners for weeks and yeah, I'm like, I don't yeah. give a shit and I hate anymore. yourself for behaving I, like that. I, I, I look, look back, back at things it, I hate myself I look for back it, but I'm the worst. Like, you little child, like, yeah, grow yeah. up, you little bitch. Like, do you know what I mean? Genuinely, yeah. like, we sat there and we used to get annoyed at, oh, that didn't come or this parcel, I wanted it to, I wanted that Amazon parcel to come today. Why didn't it come? Yeah, yeah. Take care of yourselves. Yeah, honestly. yeah, 100%. But it's I think a mindset thing, 100%. As you grow up and as you experience real life troubles and people sometimes it takes people to experience it 50 years old 40 years old yeah. some people are lucky enough as bad as it sounds to experience it 20 years old yeah. but I think it moulds you into a better person when 100%. you experience yeah. not even loss but just Different. hardship like yeah. actual hardship outside in life. of your usual comfort zone and to put stuff in, in, in context 100% it is and it, it, it changes people massively that's all I can say and it, it sometimes it changes people for the better and some people who can't control themselves, which you probably experienced from, as in working inside these, change people for the worse, and it, they lead to crime, and they yeah, lead to. Yeah. And I think it's that's why your job, what you do, is so important because you can get involved just then and navigate that energy. Yeah, yeah. And moving that's on to fitness, that. that, that's where fitness came in for me. Oh, really? So when I, so I just started the business when my dad was diagnosed. Okay. And. I was able to then work in hostel when I was looking, like I was going to see him three times a day. I was doing like 40 miles a day on my bike. And the one thing that kept me sane was fitness. So I saw a new purpose in it other than the vanity side, which I put my hand up and say like, <laughs> I'm not here competing in the CrossFit games. Like I'm, I'm vain in that respect. I, I trained to, to try and look, like yeah. to improve how my body looked. That's how I started it. But that kept me kept me in the room sane. And, and then I saw a new sort of um, benefit in it. And, and that's the the thing that kept me going and all my anger and all the stuff that we talk about could that could lead to aggression crime drink drugs the way i navigated it was through just battering my physical self in the gym and letting i didn't have anything left at the end of the day i don't mate. think people understand how important gym is for you yeah. as much as like we probably still go to gym now to look good yeah to try i, I happily say i go, do but if i didn't do i'd be a nasty person this is what i was about to say like to go on holiday look good take your top yeah. off and people oh yeah and look in the mirror like don't get it tweeted i post pictures topless on yeah. instagram yeah yeah not because i want girls to see it yeah I post it and I'm like, shit, that hard work's paying off. Yeah, this is yeah, me yeah, doing yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. And I think even if I don't go gym for a week, I just become rude. I become yeah, like, yeah. not Touchy. aggressive. I'm not aggressive, but as in I just become a bit more Grumps. less paid. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But when I go gym in the morning, 
I'm a lot more energy. Like, and people think, oh, I had to go to the gym at eight o'clock in the morning. You must yeah. be shattered. I'm like, it's the opposite. If I miss gym, yeah. I'm shattered. Yeah, you're knackered if you do nothing. Yeah, Literally, 100%. It makes a massive difference. Even this morning before the podcast, I thought, all right, I've got to go to the gym at 8 a.m., get home for nine, shower up, get ready, beer for 10.30, set up, get ready. Mm. If I didn't go to the gym today, I would probably be sitting here yawning. Yeah, you don't get started for the day. It's, yeah. it's different. It changes you. And I think you've experienced that, but it's been your business has experienced it as well. Yep. Which is amazing. You're doing the thing you love. And it's improving you as a person. Yeah, 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 it's, exactly. It's not even a bit. It's not even a work anymore. That no. is life. And there's a massive shift in that as well within the fitness industry now, where people are kind of trying to bring all of it together. Well, it's okay, fine. Most people will put their hand up and say, "Yeah, I'd, I'd like to start training to change the way I look." Most people will be honest about that in some respect. I would like to be healthier and fitter. I would like to feel happier and and more confident. And also, yeah, I'd like not to be so stressed or so grumpy or or feel more energized. Yeah. So you can get them all under one roof. So it's a win, right? It yeah, doesn't mean you have sure. to go five days a week and no. eat broccoli every five minutes. <laughs> like, I'm not saying that at all. It doesn't need to be like that, but I think I can see the value in it. And again, when you piece all those puzzle pieces together we've been talking about, yeah, it's, it's taken trial and error to learn them. But I didn't learn it at school. I didn't learn it at uni. I didn't learn it from my parents. I've taken bits and bobs from everywhere and worked out what are the guiding principles I need in my life, what's come along and kind of tried to rock the boat, but I've been able to use for strength to go on and achieve more from. And when you start to put those together... When other people come to you and need advice, I feel more like an owl, a bit wiser. I'm not old, but yeah. you've, you've had enough. You don't have to have experienced everything, but you've had enough of an experience of certain elements of life and the commercial side of stuff to put together and actually help people that are going through maybe five years before you or going through a similar journey that you've already been through. And they can go to someone and go, oh, I would, I'd like some genuine advice for someone that's understood that rather than going online and trying to understand it from this crazy world that is social media, which, I mean, how much content is confusing, how much is useful, how much actually adds value, how much is just to make money. It's, it's very hard to navigate. And with social media, I think a lot of people set stuff up in place to make it look in a certain way, if that makes sense. Whereas when you're discussing someone with something with someone, it's my story might not help you. No. But if I tell my story might help X or Z or Y, whereas yeah. on social media, when you're watching it, you're watching someone's story and people try and make it relatable to their life. Yep. And I think that's the problem. Whereas when you talk to someone who's, you might be an amazing mentor for me, yep. but you might be a terrible mentor for 100%. my sister. Yeah, 100%. And I think people don't realize that just because you're good with me, some people might come to you and be like, oh yeah, you've helped my mate. You're going to help me. Yeah, but yeah. You, it, it just might not work for you. You might not be that key for them. It no. Might, but people try and force it. Yeah, and, and then it, and then they get annoyed with you because they're like, well, it's not why working. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think or people, they think money's just going to grow on a tree or something. It's, it's mad. I, yeah, I, I work with so many different people from it because I do a bit of uh, like I do business mentorship. I work as a business consultant for businesses, and I do one to one like kind of life mentorship, but not through something that I ever started as a business idea. People genuinely used to reach out and say, and still do, off the back of podcasts. Do you know what? That's really interesting. I'm struggling with that. How do you get through it? And want to know more detail? And like you say, that it's amazing to be able to add that value to people's life. But because it's not really a business, unlike selling a course where you know that someone's agenda really is just to make money. Yeah, it's true. And that's, that's true. the trouble. And a lot of people will look for, well, I want to be an entrepreneur, so I'll go online, look at entrepreneurs, and I can't watch that advice a lot of it. It's annoying. It's, it, it's, if it's you fake. actually dissect it's what people fake. are saying, it's waffle. <laughs> it's, 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 it's jumble. It's riddles. People are talking in circles. No one can tell anyone on this planet how to have a successful business. The only advice I give to anyone is work hard. Yeah, work yeah. Like, People are like, I can give you the recipe to a million pound. No, you can't. If you could, people, you're the not. Amount people are buying to that. Sad as well. If if you could, what are you giving me the recipe for? Yeah, get up at five o'clock in the morning. <laughs> and then people get up at five o'clock in the morning. And, they're like, what do I and do? then a shift finishes work at midnight, and they've had five hours sleep. And like, oh, I feel awful. <laughs> it's like five o'clock in the morning. That whole five a.m. club stuff. And again, I'm not ridiculing it. It works for some people, but you can't just give a blanket. It's like saying to you, right? Do you know what? After conversation today, mate, I really want you in bed by nine. I've got restaurants to run or whatever. Like I've got stuff to do. Like you can't, you can't just give a blanket rule. But you can give it a blanket rule if you're selling a course yeah. for a grand, because it's got to apply to everyone that's listening. So I try and navigate people around it because people do do that stuff and spend a huge amount of money, and they're like, oh, it's not really working. I'm knackered. Clearly, it's I'm not losing working. money. I've left my job because he said I need to be a risk taker, <laughs> and now I'm in this pickle. I've left my job. And the only today. person winning is the guy selling the course, right? He's laughing. He's creasing. And he's probably not even waking up at 5 a.m. himself. He's in his pants eating peanut it's butter in the day. He doesn't care. It's madness. And the thing is, though, people genuinely look at social media and take it for, like, it word, and they believe that's what it is. And I'm like, honestly, I don't think I've ever woken up at 5 a.m. genuinely. Like, no, unless I've had to catch a flight. Or I, that's yeah, I just, yeah. Unless I've got a plane to catch yeah. or something. But 
everyone don't understand. Everyone's journey is different. Like you, I could be here today and this podcast could go absolutely viral tomorrow and make me millions of pounds and I don't need to work in a restaurant. Like, I don't need mm. to be at the restaurant anymore. Yeah. Like what is meant for you is going to come to you. Just yeah. chill out. And that's not because, like you just said, with that podcast, if it went viral, it's not because you're a mastermind no. algorithm and then I destroyer. Can't, I can't make a course. It's luck. Yeah. I can't make a course how to have a, a viral video. Come but that's because you've got a conscience, right? It's, it's but for every man like you, another person would go, let me tell you how to master yeah. that algorithm. <laughs> like, I've never had a real bang on, on Instagram. One went, like, my first one went viral last week, okay? I couldn't care less, to be honest. It's, it's embarrassing. But people sell a course off that. Yeah, it's madness. People don't actually, it, it's... I'm just going to start. I've had a few viral TikToks. I'm fucking... Guys, if you're on a course, just shout me. I'll look after yeah, you. Yeah, literally. It's, uh, and, but the thing is, people buy into that. And it's, it's sad, though, because people are they losing it. their life savings, some of them. Because people, sometimes people use that last thousand pound... Buying to, a dream. Yeah, and, and then a month down the line, they're like, shit, this didn't work. It's interesting. We were talking about this before the podcast, weren't we? Is the social media, there's living in it and is using it for what it's useful. I, I love to be able to help people. If, if one person watches this and listens to this and thinks, you know what, thank you, I'm really happy yeah. that we spent a good few hours of our day doing it because that's what this is about. I'm not making money matters. That's not, that's not what it's about. It's about actually giving value online, yeah. which I think not enough people do. And I, I've said a few times as well, like people are like, oh, would you pay your guests to come on? And I was like, I, I will never pay a guest. Not no. because I don't want to, but if you come on here, let's say I gave you 500 pounds today. Yeah. You're going to come on here and this is a job. Yeah. You're not going to come on here with the intention to help people. Mm. And my podcast, I never started a podcast to make money from no. it or anything. I started it because truthfully, I enjoy waffling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it's it. It's good to have a natter. I yeah, genuinely yeah, yeah. enjoy talking shit. Yeah. That's the truth. And yeah, I yeah. thought, throw up some cameras, upload it. If it does well, it does well. If it doesn't, yeah, yeah, exactly. it is what it is. And people are delusional. Like, the, it, Obviously, if a podcast does really, really well, you can make good money, but you're not sat here making... You know, no, you're not gonna, it's not going to change no, your no, life. No, no, no. It's not. You're not going to become fucking the next billionaire. No, you're not going to be tatey I, overnight. Yeah. Like, do you know what I mean? <laughs> you know yeah. What I mean? Well, that's the thing, isn't it? But if you commit to that stuff, you probably could. You could. You could probably make money. But it, it would just have a different kind of um, narrative. It wouldn't be the same. I, I don't like even down to like all the crypto traders and stuff like that. That let's not even get. That's a whole other ball game. Let's not. Yeah, even people have lost that. a lot over that stuff. Yeah. I've Chance. never. Never. I don't Chance. understand it. If I don't understand that, I'm not involved. And do you know what it is? I've had a lot of people say who I've had on the podcast say, if I can't hold it and it's not in my hands or it's not in my bank, I'm not interested in it. And I agree to it as well. Like it, yeah. I, I do. Like money is money. It used to always be cash, and I used to always have cash on me. Now yeah. it's always on Apple Pay. Literally, I'm spending so much. Yeah. Just, fuck! I just tap everything. Yeah, out. you don't think. Yeah. It's Bring back joke. the two little coins in my hands. Yeah, that's when you used to hand them over. I used to be like, oh. Do you know what it is? When I was in school, uh, I was so eager to grow yeah, up. Yeah. Now I swear to God, if someone could say to me, "Are you go ready?" Back to, in time. I'll straight away yeah, take that and say, yeah, "Send it." I'll 100%. go back to being like fucking 100%. thirteen years old. Hundred percent. Well, I think we've covered everything, though. Yeah, that's, that's, my, that's my journey to where I am today, really. I'm taking me from, from 10 years old back to 34. We covered 24 years. Pretty <laughs> impressive, to be fair. <laughs> that's, that's not bad. But I th yeah, I think like to, to summarise everything, um, I don't think anything in life is... I don't think there's a script. I don't think you know where it's going to take you. Things will come along and fly and kick you in the head. That's normal. 100%. Life's not linear. Life will never be... If you want life to be a 10 out of 10 and you're comparing life to a 10 out of 10, you're going to be disappointed, I would say. If it's running at a seven, yeah, having a good time. I think, personally, yeah, that, that's how are. I sit. I'm buzzing at a seven or an eight. I want 10 and I'll strive for 10. But if you can accept a seven or eight, you'd be a happy guy or girl. I, I think 10, if you do want a 10 out of 10 life, the best way to do it is not compare your life to anyone else's. Go to a remote island. Yeah. And just, and just turn off your phone, yeah. <laughs> sunbathe, eat good food. And just don't do anything. And do what you like most. And that's it. That, that's that's life at the end of the yeah. day. But listen, honestly, it was a pleasure having Thanks you on having the show. Really I can sit here and talk to you all night or all day. We'll do another one at some yeah, point. Hundred yeah. percent. Listen, Thanks pleasure so having much. you on. Thank Cheers. you for coming Appreciate on the it, show. Mate.